Hello, hello, my fuzzy ferrets. Welcome to another top 10 list from yours truly. This list was suggested by a dear YouTube friend, Seb. Hey Seb, if you're listening, who wanted to know what my top 10 suggestions for games to start trophy hunting with were. Occasionally people ask me why I trophy hunt. I feel like it tends to be an if you know, you know kind of deal. People who usually ask are asking more of a way to be like, what's the point? Why waste your time on useless trophies? Like, I don't know. I work hard at my job, I go out to see my friends, and then I get home and shag some games. It's not that deep. I have always tried to get 100% in games ever since I was a kid. I would replay Spyro the Dragon over and over and over again, getting 100% every time. All the Rugrats games, every game I had, I finished. It's always been how I've played, even before achievements existed. I love feeling as though I'm conquering a game, playing it to its fullest, experiencing everything the designers intended. Sure, sometimes games have ridiculously boring trophies, literally just for finishing the story, and some games have ridiculously over-the-top trophies, but largely it's always an appropriate and rewarding challenge. A few, and I do honestly mean a few, like five, people have asked me what I would suggest as games to start trophy hunting with, and so in this video I will be presenting some nice games to begin your trophy hunting journey with. So my criteria for the selection are as follows. I'm not looking for super easy games, I assume that you've played plenty of games in your time, you've already got favourites, and you've got a really good understanding of what you like, you're probably very good at what you play. These games also had to be games that I enjoyed. These are recommendations based on my own taste. These plats won't necessarily be easy, but they will be fun and rewarding, so let's go. And before I begin, if you like the list, please remember to like the video and subscribe to me here on YouTube. I make lots of gaming content, reviews, rankings, general discussion, so if that sounds like something you'd enjoy, please make sure to subscribe so that you never miss another upload from me. I also want to take a quick moment to thank my patrons. Thank you patrons. What's more, please drop your own suggestions for the best games to start trophy hunting with below. This list was actually really hard to narrow down to 10, so I will always appreciate the extra voices. With that out of the way, let's get on with the video. My first suggestion for a beginner platinum trophy would be Okami. Okami is a beautiful action-adventure RPG published by Capcom, initially released on the PlayStation 2 in 2006 with an HD remaster on the PlayStation 3 in 2013 and the PS4 in 2017. There's also a Vita version you can play. There are a lot of ways to play Okami. Too many, one might say. In Okami you play as Amaterasu, or Ami, a white wolf and actual goddess who has the power, broadly, of paint. She can paint bridges into existence, make flowers bloom, make the sunrise, and she uses this to traverse this massive gorgeous world, solving puzzles and helping residents. There's also a poo button, but it's a late game technique and you have to unlock it first. When you first start the game you're very weak, you barely have any power and only one weapon. As the game goes on you unlock tons of abilities and lots of weapons for a variety of playstyles. We've got plate, we've got unfinished jigsaw, we've got three oreos in a triangle formation, we've got spicy anal beads, and then like five variations of the same sword. All of the playstyles are workable in their own way, meaning there's plenty of flexibility in a game that doesn't really look like it would have a lot of flexibility. It's a fairly long game to 100%, I think it took me at least 50 hours, maybe 70, but it's super varied and very fun. Not only are there story related trophies, but there's collectibles in the form of beastery entries, you need to fight one of each beast at least, there's beads which are found around the world and are given as rewards for completing challenges, and there are tomes of all different kinds to fill. There are a few missable trophies but nothing outrageous, just make a few notes on things to look out for and you'll be sound, and if you still miss one you can comfortably go into New Game Plus to clean up. Unfortunately, every version of Okami all share one stack, so you can't get three separate plats for it, it's all one. I kind of hate that, I would have happily done this game twice. Okami was the second game I ever got the Platinum Trophy for, the first being Spire of the Dragon, but I had been working on Okami long before the Reignited Trilogy was released, so it's near and dear to my heart and I can't tell you how much I wish it would get a PS5 release so I could finish it all over again. I usually hate JRPG tropes in games, but Okami has been the one single exception. I love it. Our second suggestion for first time platinum trophies is Uncharted Drake's Fortune. Uncharted is a phenomenally popular and well known series that likely needs no introduction, but since you're here I'll give you one. Uncharted 1 was released on the PlayStation 3 in 2007 and then remastered for the PlayStation 4 in 2015. Uncharted Drake's Fortune follows our boy Nathan as he recovers the coffin of his ancestor Francis Drake. Francis Drake was a real guy, an English explorer, and in this game he's finally back, and he's discovered the location of Elder. Dorado, the lost city of gold, but he's also dead so he can't go there anymore. So now, with your old grandpappy's notes at your disposal, you head off to find it and trouble ensues. Uncharted is a fantastic game to both play for fun and to platinum. Nathan Drake initially seems like an annoying gung-ho classic movie protagonist, but he really grows on you. He's definitely an annoying gung-ho classic movie protagonist, but he's also very funny, very likeable, and he really loves history, learning and experiencing all the culture he's mowing down with whatever automatic rifle you've got infinite ammo for. 
for. The climbing mechanics can occasionally be very clunky, but the gunplay works and the combat is fun and engaging. There's a bunch of difficulty trophies that stack. You can go for the hardest difficulty trophy first, so that a bunch pop at once right at the end, or you can replay the game a few times over on increasing difficulties to slowly warm yourself up to it. A warning though, crushing difficulty is an absolute bitch and it's not even the worst difficulty available. There are collectibles, but not so many that you're constantly referring to a guide, a bunch of miscellaneous trophies related to certain numbers of kills with certain numbers of weapons, and if you delve into the DLC, there's fun speedrun trophies too and the infamous brutal difficulty. Overall, this is a very short platinum, definitely less than 20 hours, but it's super fun and I highly recommend it. In third place we have the obligatory FromSoft game. If you've been playing games for a while, you'll likely be plenty familiar with the FromSoft series and will probably have played this game before. Arguably Bloodborne or Sekiro could have sat very comfortably on this list, but for number three I chose Elden Ring. We've got Grimdark Pinocchio, we've got Flat Goth Spyro, we've got a Resident Evil boss, we've got a spindly little ginger woman, we've got some gargoyles, we've got a big goth who kidnaps little boys, and finally we've got Man with an Annoying Fan Club who won't stop fucking going on about his horse. Yes, I know he learned gravity magic so that he could continue to ride his childhood horse without crushing it. More to the point, what horrible voodoo is he using to keep that poor thing alive for so long it looks miserable. There's plenty of co-op potential as well, so this is a fun one to do with friends. But Mert, isn't the Elden Ring plat really hard? No. Elden Ring definitely has the easiest platinum trophy of all the FromSoft games. You can get every boss and every item in a single playthrough with enough prep, leaving you with only the three ending trophies to wrap up your list. At that point it's up to you whether you want to save scum them or just finish the game twice more, and honestly it's a good game so the choice is pretty tough, especially since the game lets you respec infinitely, meaning you can just dabble in whatever you want, whenever you want, and can switch builds as much as you want between each playthrough. There's much less to collect with this game as well. The original Demon Souls and both versions of Dark Souls ask you to collect basically everything, and Dark Souls 2 and 3 have requirements for you to grab every single spell that's ever existed for some reason. All of them fundamentally require you to go into New Game Plus 2, including Sekiro if you want an even remotely easy time with the experience grind, which sounds 10 times harder than it actually is, but still it's a worthwhile endeavour if you can be asked doing the same thing three times. Elden Ring's mainly on this because it's got a slightly smoother start than Bloodborne, but I mean, all things considered, how smooth can a start be with a FromSoft game? Number 4 on our list is The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. The Witcher 3 is a game I would probably recommend to someone who's never played a game before, never mind as one of their first platinum trophies. I love The Witcher 3 and always have. I know the game has its flaws, and I know in some ways it's a bit overhyped, the story drags on quite a lot, but I love it. Especially the DLCs, Hearts of Stone and Blood and Wine, which add an incredible story and an incredible new map respectively, super cheap on release, but absolutely cramming in another 30 hours of content easily apiece. Not to mention all the free DLC that's been rolled out over the years just to enhance the base experience with new quests and items. The combat has a high skill ceiling, with lots of available builds dabbling in everything from spells to bombs to alchemy, but it's also super accessible. You can just light attack your way through the game if you really want to, even on death march with the right stat allocations, which I proudly did. You whack on that reincarnation skill from the red tree, strap on Quen, and spin. You can play the game through and do everything there is to do in story mode, only to do death march on new game plus, or you can just go straight in with death march from the beginning and struggle bad in the short term but for a faster platinum. The main story can run you 30 hours if you're being thorough and not skipping cutscenes, so sometimes it's preferable to bite the bullet, play it on hard from the beginning, and turn it down to story mode when you're done. The Witcher 3 is a great game to start trophy hunting with because it includes every single kind of trophy. We have difficulty trophies, collectible trophies, missable trophies, questline trophies, progression trophies, and miscellaneous trophies. The missable trophies aren't super intrusive on your experience, you can make notes of them without seeing big spoilers, and keep a notebook handy with you as you play just to check you're not about to lock yourself out of things, and the game allows you to track trophy related quests, particularly the Gwent card collector trophy, so you don't miss a missable and not realise. The first time I got the platinum for this it took me about 150 hours, playing as thoroughly as I could. The second time it took 70, and the third time it took 40. If you can beat my time, I'll let you kick both of my parents down the stairs. My favourite thing about this platinum and the 100% is that if you go for it, there is an absolutely packed world full of things to do, and some of those things are women. Number 5 on the list is Overcooked 2. Overcooked 2 is not only one of my favourite games of all time, but it's also one of my favourite platinum trophies, purely for just how fun it is to achieve. Let me set the scene. Overcooked 2 is set in the Onion Kingdom, where the Onion King has read from the Necronomicon, an ancient text that, well, I mean, I don't quite know what he wanted to achieve by reading it since it's pretty clearly a text about raising the unbred, but he reads it and lo and behold, the horde of the unbred rise and this dumb onion has the gall to be shocked. Like what did you think it was going to do, Onion King? Get off the table and suck you off? 
off. Anyway, with that rotund fool's mistakes aside and the world now under siege by the unbred, you, the royal chefs, need to clean up after him, ensuring he never learns a lesson and never needs to take accountability. In an adorable mobile food bus, you travel across the land, sending the unbred back to the grave by cooking. The game's not incredibly specific on that one or how it works, but it's a solid basis for a good game, so I'll let it slide. You gotta cook. No, we won't tell you why. Overcooked 2 is a good premise for any game. It's a top-down view of the kitchen with up to four chefs that can scurry around, preparing dishes to order, maintaining the workspace, and avoiding whatever insta-death traps lie in wait. There are platforms that need to be moved around, fires that need to be extinguished, and dishes that need to be cleaned. Each map has a few different levels, all with different gimmicks that you'll need to learn. Conveyor belts, rats that steal food, platforms that disappear or move around, specific cookware like big old timey ovens, blenders and barbecues, and environmental hazards like slippery ice, alien appendages, and literally the fucking sea. If you're looking for a co-op game with friends, you'll be sorted here. And if you're looking for something single player, you're sorted too. You can play Overcooked 2 with up to three friends, but you can also play it solo if you really want to, although you will have to control two chefs, which is challenging. There are no missable trophies in Overcooked 2, which is nice and relaxing. A lot of the trophies are tied to progression, so you'll get them naturally. Some of them are miscellaneous, such as putting certain amounts of food items in the bin. The rest are related to scores per level. You'll need to three-star every level in the game, which honestly is more time-consuming than it is hard. The game can be considered fairly easy. The levels in the first game were absurdly difficult at points, so Team 17 toned down the difficulty for Overcooked 2 significantly. However, if you find the challenge isn't enough, they make their DLCs absolutely rock-solid, so you can always resort to those when you want to have your co-op skills put to the test. Shadow of the Colossus is a game most people will have heard of, but few people get around to playing. It's fantastic, and almost entirely unique in story, gameplay, world building, and exploration. You hunt, kill, and eat lizards in the overworld to expand your stamina. Your final reward is reaching a garden that serves no purpose. You ride a horse that controls like a GTA 5 speedboat. As the game goes, loosely, you need to resurrect a girl you love. The game never really explains why she's died and what's going on, and I don't want to spoil too much of the story, so feel free to play it for yourself and get a feel for this actually pretty difficult moral dilemma. You're a stranger in these lands in every sense of the word. You're running around in places that simply weren't made for you. It's like being six foot four and trying to find a bed you don't have to sleep diagonally in or a hanging lamp that you don't knock your head on. You can't. The world belongs to us, the five foot fours, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's a land full of ancient temples crumbled to ruin, now guarded by 16 unique colossi. There's huge birds, lumbering quadrupeds, lonely knights, subterranean dwarves, although not with their characteristically small stature. Incredibly designed and beautifully rendered, these colossi offer a unique challenge every time you face them. These colossi can't be defeated in conventional ways either. It's not like the classic boss fight where you pitch yourself up next to the enemy's ankle and just whack away at them until their health bar drops to zero. There's thinking involved, and every boss is a new challenge to overcome in a myriad of different ways. This Platinum is fun not only for the basic progression, but also for the variety of challenges it offers. Every Colossus has a normal mode fight and a hard mode fight, and then a normal time attack fight and a hard mode time attack fight, each time unlocking useful weapons you can carry forwards. There's actually a pretty easy speedrun trophy too, like you can probably comfortably beat the game twice in the time it gives you, but it's fun and generous and it's a nice introduction to speedrun trophies, so that's all that matters. It probably won't take more than 30 hours to beat this game, all things considered. What's more, there's nothing missable in this game so you're free to spend however long you want soaking up the sights and just enjoying the gameplay. And this game has so much gameplay to enjoy. This game's another one that can be done co-op or single player. The Forest takes our number 7 spot because it's fantastic. It is a beloved RPG, in some ways for its rich atmosphere, gorgeous visuals, and unique systems of caves and cannibals, but in other ways for how adorably janky it is. The game's been out several years now and it feels like an alpha build, but gosh if it didn't charm the pants off me. It sounds bad but it's utterly charming, and The Forest has long since cemented itself as one of my favourite games ever. Despite all its wonderful, beautiful flaws, I recommend it to everyone. Not only is it a fantastic game, but but it's an engaging and fun platinum. You'll be playing with a co-op partner who will just randomly go on fire. You can jump infinitely against certain walls to get places you shouldn't be able to reach. You do life-changing actions on hilariously inappropriate Unity Store assets, like rigging a death machine on a laptop on an upturned bucket that isn't even plugged in. The platinum for this game heartily encourages you to spend as long as you want just playing, exploring, and building. There's tons to do in this game. There are systems of subterranean caves full of treasures to steal. There's snowy mountaintops with untold secrets you need real 
wheel gear to traverse. There's miles of forest full of cannibal villages and effigies constructed from the bodies of your fellow crash landers. The trophy Bad Father asks that you spend 100 in-game days without finding your son, a feat you can just kind of leave your PlayStation on overnight for, but one that can easily be done just by enjoying everything this game has to offer. There's a vegan playthrough challenge, a cannibal eating challenge, a building challenge. Every trophy in this rich and fantastic game asks for you to reach the furthest reaches of the game, push yourself in mad and unexpected ways, and make the most of all the mechanics available. There's a trophy for collecting and mounting one of every single huntable species head in the game, although this includes ducks for some reason. And for reference, the ducks in this game act fundamentally the same as leaves blowing in the wind. They fly in the sky and swim in the water, and should you kill them and they die in the water, they just despawn. They're set dressing, they don't even have collision detection. Not including the 100 days trophy, this game can be done in little to no time, especially if you rush through the game for the first time and unlock the creative mode, which allows you to play without worrying about cannibals, hunger, or thirst. In fact, a lot of trophies become trivial in that mode, you just have to beat the final boss to unlock it first. She's an incredible amount of fun as well, mainly because I have absolutely no idea what actually works on her. Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled is number 8 on our list, and it is a game I can honestly tell you I never ever thought I would enjoy. I dabbled in Mario Kart as a kid and I know my way roughly around Need for Speed Underground, but racing games aren't my forte, and while I do enjoy them, I never go out of my way to play them. So when I picked up a copy of Crash Team Racing, I expected to work through it, roughly have an alright time with it, and then move on to the next thing. No, I became obsessed. Crash Team Racing is easily my favourite racing game ever. I was utterly devoted to this game for the better part of a month. Whenever I wasn't working or streaming, I was burying my head in this game and just motorboating it for hours. I would go to bed thinking about this and I would wake up to play it. My fingers would hurt. As I worked through the levels and into the time trials, I got a terminal case of Devil May Cramp. I don't even consider that healthy either. It's not so much a brag as it is a cautionary tale. You will absolutely adore this game and you will have no idea why. It's one of the most fun, most compelling, most addictive gaming experiences I have ever enjoyed, and god alive did I enjoy it. Although it might be tempting to jump in at the deep end, I heartily recommend doing the completionist playthrough on easy mode. Hard mode on this game is vile. It is beyond nasty. The AI get absolutely filthy with their rubber banding, their obvious and unapologetic teleporting, their perfect aim, their perfect boosts, and their perfect pickups. Just getting to grips with it on easy mode and flying through will be a welcome experience, and it will be one you miss when you start getting your ship pushed in hard later down the line. Crash Team Racing Platinum has some fairly basic expectations. You need to 100% the story, you need to finish the game on hard mode, you need to win every match, including the extra optional matches, you need to do some miscellaneous bullshit in the PvP mode, which you can boost by yourself with the second controller, and you need to finish all the time trials. Once you've completed hard, I'd say largely the worst of this is out the way. The time trials are also insanity, but in a different way. You're not tilting into the sun as Neocortex blasts you with a bomb on the finish line and blows past you at the last second four hours into attempts, you're just mastering routes and how best to traverse them, so it's it's a different kind of difficulty, but personally it's one I preferred. The time trials are intimidating, but they're so fun, so rewarding, and to this day I have been happy to offer up any one of my mods as sacrifices for a full PS5 port with a complete trophy list. Come on, Toys for Bob, release them. Resident Evil Village is the 28th entry in the Resident Evil series. If we include the absolute army of mobile games they released, it's probably closer to the 40th, but technically of the main series it's number 8, which is easier to remember than number 32. Like most Resident Evil games, it's a fairly linear game. None of them are strictly open world, and this one does kind of pretend to be open world, but with a lack of vendors or anything to interact with, it becomes more a way to backtrack and grab fish you missed for some trophies and collectibles just before you go to the final boss. The great thing about this game is that you earn CP, an absolutely appalling acronym for the game's point system, which you can spend in the CP shop. Again, dreadful acronym. But with this you can buy infinite ammo for all of your guns, and special weapons that you can use to make later difficulties trivial. All things considered, this is nowhere near the hardest Resident Evil Platinum. Most of it is just fidgety and a bit specific, but with some missable stuff to keep an eye on and some specific constraints on your runs. And collectibles you will grab, because that is the basic gist of this trophy. On your first run it will be beneficial to run through and grab a bunch of wooden goats, some basic weapon attachments and breakable windows. You'll need to do a speed run with a very generous time constraint, a no healing run, a low spend run, and a run on the hardest difficulty at the very least since all difficulties stack. You'll also eventually need to buy all concept art and all the miniatures and then give them a nice read through for a trophy. There's also easy stuff like simply opening photo mode, killing a specific enemy that spawns late game, and beating a late game boss right at the beginning, an easy feat when you've got those infinite weapons I talked about earlier. The worst part of this platinum will be mercenaries. In mercenaries you need to run through a select area killing enemies to build your point multipliers. There are a few levels on normal difficulty which are pretty doable, but then there are a bunch on hard that are a massive pain in the arse, so proceed with caution. 
Finally, we have Neo 2. Neo is one of the best games I've ever played, no joke. In my Song of Horror review, I mentioned that I don't like playing Bloodborne, and this game is the culprit. Neo's combat system is so developed, so refined, so complex, and yet so smooth and seamless and perfect that I can honestly say it raised my expectations and then left my life. Neo is a game separated into individual maps, each of which have several levels apiece. Some levels are full story levels, some are side quests, and some are boss fights. The levels don't flow into each other, you pick them from a map. The focus of Neo is pure on the combat, so while the levels do look amazing, a lot of them get reused. You'll have them played back to front, or with certain sections locked off, or with extra objectives and items. It's not a bad thing and it doesn't affect your experience, considering that experience is geared specifically towards combat, but it is worth mentioning. The bosses all look incredible though. They're intricately designed, unique, and really, really fucking hard. That's the real stinger of Neo. If you get the platinum for this, you'll only ever need to play a new game. It's a nice little time. It's actually not too bad. The bosses might pose a bit of an issue, but they're very doable. If you decide to go for the 100% however, you will be in a whole new world. Neo is known for being a very cruel game, it's very unfair, but it gives you all the tools to be really unfair back. To unlock everything you need, you'll likely end up in New Game Plus 4, and you have to complete every single level up through New Game Plus 2 for these trophies, which will really push you. But this section isn't about Neo, is it? It's about Neo 2. Of the pair of them, I would always say that Neo 2 is the best one to begin with. Neo 2 is a game I would consider to be Neo 1 with training wheels. It's not an easier game by any means, but there's a greater variety in builds and abilities, including new parry abilities that the first game didn't have, that mean you've always got more options while you're getting stomped into the floor. It makes things feel a bit more doable, knowing you can return to a boss with a different approach. Sure, there are plenty of approaches with Neo 1, but I just find Neo 2 to be a bit more flexible, and it's got a character creator so you can have massive tits while you do it. And that's all for our list of the top 10 games I recommend you start trophy hunting with. Like I said, trophy hunting isn't for everyone, but it is for me. As always, feel free to drop your own recommendations in the comments below, and remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I release gaming content as often as I can, be it reviews, rankings, or just discussion, so if you enjoy that, please subscribe so you never miss another upload from me. Thank you as always to my patrons, and thank you, dear viewer, for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.